Hey everyone, welcome back at long last to Honor for Hire. I know, I know, it's been a while. I've been working on the project intermittently throughout the year and I've finally whipped myself back into productive shape. That being said, over the past month or two I've checked a number of features off my task list and it's finally time to show them off as I jump fully into the development process. I got a number of comments on the first devlog about enemy death and damage animations so that was the first thing I tackled. I then went on to learn more about Godot's particle system and topped it off with the foundation for every future enemy attack. Yeah, a small task, I know. Now let's get rolling and talk about how I added these features. Before we begin, I am of course contractually obligated to mention that you guys should all subscribe and join my Discord server, the link to which is in the description. We've got a little ways to go for a thousand subscribers, and if we can get there off of this video, I will consider having a community vote for a feature to be added to the game. I also want to do a Q&A, so as usual, leave any questions or suggestions down in the comments. With that out of the way, let's get started. To begin, I needed to decide how I was going to show enemies taking damage and dying. This might change in the future for larger enemies or bosses, but with basic enemies I didn't want to go all out and animate every single part of them. That would require four different animations for both the damage and death, a lot more ifs and elses, and overall a lot of hassle that could be avoided simply by utilizing the resources that Godot gave me. So of course I used my intuition and knowledge about the Godot engine to find a way to make the enemy flash when hit. I'd wanted to do some simplification within the enemy scripts for a while, and this gave me the opportunity to move everything that I needed into a hit taken function. After I tossed in the line to change the color of the sprite, I made sure to yield for a brief amount of time before changing it back. I messed with the timings for a little bit and eventually settled on this as the final effect, and I think it looks quite nice. The other thing I had to do after that was, of course, an effect on death. I wanted the enemy to explode outward in a burst of pixels, then have those pixels fade away at different times, so I started messing around with Godot's particle system. I created a particle for death that was a single white pixel, went to import it, and then realized that the default particle in Godot was, wait for it, a single white pixel. But after that slight goof, I started actually designing the explosion. At first I found a way to make the pixels spread in a circle, but with the one-shot property they were just shooting out in a plain ring. I then proceeded to go through every single tab until I found the properties I was looking for. Velocity, acceleration, and the randomness for both. Combined with a random lifetime for the particles, I now had an honest-to-goodness explosion on my hands. Later on I added a diagonal rotation as well, so the particles spin at random amounts. That brainwave came along as I was designing the next use for the particle system an animated plume of smoke. This was more of an experiment that I wanted to try rather than a feature that was on my list, but it was simple to achieve and the final effect looked quite nice. This was a matter of ramping the particles up to ungodly amounts, flipping gravity, and fiddling with the color gradient tool for the particles. I also decided on a direction for the wind to blow, so the x value of gravity is set to 1 to achieve that drift into the air. All of the smoke particles have random speeds, accelerations, and lifetimes, just like the explosion, so the top of it doesn't just cut off the plume in a straight line. I attached this to the chimney of one of the houses and made sure it didn't lag in-game, and it ran beautifully. The final step I had to do, though, was linking it up with a visibility script. I used this opportunity to reduce some of the janky collisions I had on the house and made it a cleaner polygon. And now I need to repeat that process with all of the other houses, which I'll do later, I'm sure. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I also created a camera shake system that I can call from anywhere. That happens whenever the player's damaged, which is now a function that I can call globally. But something that I'd been putting off came to my attention. The spear goblin still had a boring basic attack. This was beginning to get on my nerves, and I decided it was time to buckle down and figure out how to make different enemies have different attacks. Couldn't be too difficult, right? Yeah, I couldn't have been further from the truth. The Spear Goblin's attacks took two weeks on their own to iron out and make the code for, and they still have a long way to go. I had to reorganize my pathfinding script once during this process, moving the enemy attacks into their own unique function. I also figured out all sorts of stuff involving when to yield, what direction the enemy should check, how far it would move, when to have it sit still. Overall, very complicated, but something that I think was 100% worth the effort. Once it was done, I had a very satisfying effect. The Spear Goblin has two unique attacks, the dash, which isn't finished yet, 
takes him in a straight line towards the player, and it will damage the player if they remain in range. That's the one thing that I haven't added yet. The other attack is a straight stab in the direction the player is standing that takes one turn to wind up, then stabs forward. I made a new variable called Action Prepped that can be used in all sorts of ways, from deciding which animation to play, to preventing the enemy from moving or pathfinding. After that, the last thing I highlighted on my feature sheet was to have targeted squares glow red. This was going to be a difficult one. I had no idea if I could access tiles one by one, I had several ideas for how to keep track of them, and I needed to know when to get rid of highlighted tiles. I looked at the player script for some inspiration, don't ask why, and was immediately disgusted by the sheer amount of unorganized code scrolling down my screen. So I took advice from some of you and some of my friends in computer science and simplified the code using my new best friend, parameters. The attack is now almost entirely contained in one function that just has to be passed the proper parameters to run the same way as it did before, and I did a similar thing with the animation flow. Overall, it looked a lot cleaner, and I ended up compacting a lot of other scripts, so it was time to tackle the main challenge I had just handily postponed. The easiest solution I could think of for targeting tiles was to pass them to a function, add a transparent red layer for that square to an array, then clear the array when the player moves before checking for more targets and repeating the process. The fact that this was the simplest way that I could do it will say something about how difficult the task really was. This was an interesting challenge. First and foremost, though, was accessing the targeted tiles in the enemy's script. I ended up pulling the targets out of the enemy's path, but I'll have to use a different method when it comes to more unusual attacks. I then passed the enemy variable and the targets to a different script, where I instantiated a clear red targeting indicator I created and moved it into position. Finally, I had to check if the path was shorter, because if it was, I needed to create an additional square. Now this was the way that I did it initially, but about a week later I figured out that this was not going to work well, and so I reworked the system and checked stuff outside of the function so that it could just be past the targeted tiles and put a square where it needs to be. After I got it to work, I figured I would test it with the charge attack and the stab attack. I put the function in, passed it the variables, and tested it, only to find out that it actually worked somehow. I had to iron out some already present bugs, but the targeting system appeared to be working. That was until I tested two spear goblins at the same time, something I'd never tested before. And oh boy, was I glad I'd chosen to do so now of all times. The second Spear Goblin was, well, not cooperating. It would do all the correct movements, but be slightly delayed every time and perform actions that shouldn't have queued up. I swapped around the order in the scene tree, and it turns out I'd located the root of the problem. Only the first Goblin in the scene tree was working properly. I tinkered around with adding a print statement at the start of the Spear Goblin code, and while watching the console, I found the issue. Thank you, print statements. A yield statement at the end of the Spear Goblin's attack function was causing the function to wait before running for each instance of the goblin behind the first. The solution was quite simple, yet another nested function. I tested it, and everything worked, this time for real. The Spear Goblins now have overlapping attacks, charge targeting, and damage the player when they stab. I've still got to figure out how to add damage onto the charge attack, but that should only be a few simple logic statements. Besides that, the only thing I have to do now in terms of enemy targeting is figure out more complicated attacks and how they'll access the necessary tiles. But that will come at a different time. Alright, now it's time to give myself a plan to make sure that you guys don't have to wait too long for the next devlog. I've definitely cut down on my procrastination skills, so I can safely say that within a month, you will have another devlog. This time around, I think it's going to be focused less on the number of features and more on how much I can get done within a certain amount of time. Perhaps something along the lines of a week's worth of progress on my indie game. Leave any and all questions for me in the comments so that we can be ready for the 1000 subscriber Q&A that I can hopefully do, and of course make sure to join the Discord. Also, do let me know if you enjoyed the avatar I used, and if you have any suggestions for wacky poses. As always, suggestions for the game are welcome in the comments. Thank you all for joining me, and I will see you next time. Take care.